Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Corwin. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician and the emergency department lead for the Minds Matter Concussion Program. And today we'll be doing a demonstration of the Visio Vestibular Examination for Concussion um, with Maddie as our patient. So this examination has nine elements or maneuvers and we'll walk through each of the nine. The first is smooth pursuit and this involves the subject or participant tracking R as the examiner's finger in a single plane for five repetitions with increasing speed. So Maddie's gonna follow my finger for five and one back and forth is one repetition. And then we're gonna stop in the middle at her nose after five repetitions. I'm gonna repeat that. There are two different kinds of abnormalities we're looking for. So the first are abnormal signs. And as Maddie's tracking, you're seeing her eyes are moving smoothly. That's the smooth and smooth pursuit. If she has jerky or jumpy eye movements, that's an abnormal sign. The other abnormal sign is when we stop, does she have beats of nystagmus? One beat of nystagmus is normal multiple beats of nystagmus is abnormal. The other thing we'll ask Maddie about when we're finished is does she have any symptoms after doing this maneuver? And those can include headache, dizziness, eye fatigue, eye pain, or nausea. So we'll ask her, did you feel symptomatic? Nope. She'll answer she didn't, which is wonderful. And those are our abnormalities for smooth pursuit. The next two are horizontal and vertical saccades. So these are eyes moving between two fixed objects. So for horizontal saccades, I'm gonna hold my fingers about shoulder width apart. I'm going to ask Maddie to rapidly look back and forth between my fingers as she's doing. And I'm going to tell her to keep going until I tell her to stop. We want her to do 20 repetitions. One repetition is one full back and forth. She can also stop if she starts getting overly symptomatic. Now, she hasn't gotten to 20, but at the end of 20, we won't make her do all 20. We're going to ask her, does she feel symptomatic at all? And the same list of symptoms, headache, dizziness, eye fatigue, eye pain, or nausea. If she has any symptoms through 20 repetitions, that's considered an abnormal test. The other plane we're going to do this in is vertical. So same maneuver, but we're going from the forehead to a better sternal notch. And again, we're having her look up and down rapidly between my two fingers. And again, for 20 repetitions, where one repetition is one back and forth. Now for our adolescents and young adults, they're able to follow this instruction pretty easily. The younger kids will sometimes need to be paced. So what we'll often do is do this and wiggle our fingers to prompt them when to look. And if you have a teenager whose eyes are moving exceedingly slowly or trying to do it so rapidly, they're kind of stumbling over, you can also pace them using this. One of our fabulous nurse practitioners actually uses finger puppets to pace the younger children. So those are saccades. The next two maneuvers, number four and five, is gaze stability or the vestibulo-ocular reflex. So this is focusing on a fixed object while the head is moving. So I'm going to hold my thumb up and ask Maddie to stare at my thumb and shake her head no. And again, she's gonna be doing this for 20 repetitions, so one back and forth is one repetition. And if you'll look at Maddie's eyes, you'll see that they're moving from canthus to canthus, and this is what we want. So I'm gonna pause Maddie right there. Some kids are gonna be doing this, and they're gonna be moving really rapidly. We don't want that. We also don't need them to crack their neck all the way. So as long as their eyes are moving from canthus to canthus, that's what we're looking for. And it's the same idea of, are we getting symptoms provoked? So after 20 repetitions of this, we're gonna ask Maddie, does she feel any of those symptoms? Headache, dizziness, eye fatigue, eye pain, or nausea? So 20 repetitions horizontally for gait stability or the vestibular ocular reflex, and then 20 rep repetitions vertically. I'm gonna flip my thumb and ask her to shake her head yes. The reason I'm holding my thumb horizontally here is it's easier for her to fix on my thumb if it's in a different plane than she's nodding her head. So I could hold this up and down, which isn't a huge deal. It's just a little bit easier for the patient if my thumb is horizontal while she's going vertical. And while we didn't do a full 20 there, we have our patient again do this for 20. So for both saccades and gait stability, we're seeing if we're provoking symptoms with 20 repetitions. So that's one through five. Six, seven, and eight are our three tests of vision, near point of convergence, and then left and right monocular accommodation. So this is how close the patient can get an object to their face before it blurs or breaks into two. In concussion clinic, we use this ruler, um, a convergence rule, to be able to accurately get the measurement. We, in the emergency department for me, in primary care clinic for those who are general pediatricians, usually don't carry these around. I do not walk around the ED with this ruler. So the other way we can do this is every single pen has writing on it, that's the brand. Um, so you can hand your patient, um, the other thing that has writing on it is an ID. So my ID has my name on it. We prefer something with a vertical writing because it's a little easier to see when things split. So in this case, I'm gonna hand the pen to Maddie and I'm gonna say, Hold that out. Does that look clear or blurry to you? Clear. Great. And then I'm going to ask you to slowly bring it to her face. It's first going to blur. I want you to stop when it splits into two, like train tracks. Great. And then we want to measure. 
So even though we don't have a ruler, and I'm going to have Maddie try to hold that as best she can, we, in our ED at least, all of our swabs have a ruler on the back. We often use this when we're measuring things like burns or lacerations. So just grab one of these as you're starting the exam. I'm going to measure from Maddie's forehead the distance, and that's about five centimeters. Within six centimeters, so six centimeters or lower for near point of convergence is normal. The other measuring tool you can use, and we can take that from Maddie and have her relax, is a tape measure. So we all have these sitting around exam rooms for things like head circumference, so either are fine. I would encourage you to measure when we try to guesstimate differences, or distances, I should say. We often struggle and aren't as accurate, so do your best to measure. So that was near point of convergence. The last two vision maneuvers are left and right monocular accommodation. So for left monocular accommodation, we're going to have Maddie take the pen again, and she's going to close her right eye. And we're going to ask her to bring it slowly to her face until it blurs. It's not going to break into two because it's only one eye. And again, we're going to measure this distance. And that is 10 centimeters. And then I'm going to have her bring it back out and switch eyes that she's covering. So for right monocular accommodation, she's covering her left eye. Same idea. She's bringing it close to her face. When it blurs, we measure. This is also 10 centimeters. And the number to remember for this is 12. So for most people, within 12 centimeters is normal. The younger you are, the closer you're able to get this to your face. So for a school-age child, 10 centimeters is going to be our cutoff. But if there's only one number you can remember, it's 12. For adolescents, within 12 centimeters is normal. So Maddie's 10 centimeters was absolutely normal. So those are our first eight tests. And then our very last is going to be our complex tandem gait. And then our final maneuver is the complex tandem gait. So this involves having our patient walk for five steps each, forward and backwards, eyes open and closed in tandem. So I describe this to the patient as you're going to walk with one foot in front of the other, like you're walking on a tightrope. So you start walking, and I'm going to be counting my head five steps. And then when she gets to five, I'm going to have her close her eyes. And we're doing five more steps. And then after the ten steps, we'll stop her, and then I'm going to have her walk backwards. First with her eyes open for five steps, and then close your eyes, and then five more steps backwards, eyes closed. Perfect. And you can stop and open your eyes. And then we're just going to run through it one more time so I can describe what an abnormal exam is on this. So as Maddie starts to walk with her eyes open forward, we're looking for both errors and sway. So you'll see we have a pink piece of tape here. This is the straight line that Maddie is following. If she takes a step off the straight line, that's considered an error. And stop there, Maddie. So for each condition, you can have up to five errors because you have up to five tests, or steps, I should say. And then we're also looking for sway for each condition. So as Maddie's walking, you can see that right now her body's moving pretty straight. And now she's starting to sway a little bit from the vertical. Imagine a vertical line going from her head to between her feet. If she moves more than 30 degrees from that straight line or she has to raise her arms up to stabilize, that's considered sway. So four conditions for this, up to six abnormalities, meaning you could have five errors in the presence of sway. We scale this on a 0 to 24 scale, where anything more than four combined errors in sway on that 0 to 24 scale is an abnormal test. An easy way to remember that is if you cannot perform one of the conditions. So if you cannot at all walk backwards with eyes closed, that's automatically six combined errors in sway, and that's considered an abnormal test. And that is the complete Visio Vestibular exam.